Hello everyone, my name is Pam Lanuri, Head of Expedition Operations at Nova Caledonia and we have with us here today a chat with Charlie Cunningham. Charlie is an instructor at a sailing centre down in Chichester in the UK, but more importantly than that, he has been the safety officer and navigation officer for us on the Island Sky for some years now. And even more important and impressive than that, he sings a very good song at our karaoke show on board the ship. Uh, much loved. Nice to see you, Charlie. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Pam. <clears throat> my, um, my karaoke business hasn't been the same since, uh, since I left the ship. <laughs> well, we look forward to hearing that one again soon. Um, now, Charlie has kindly offered to answer some ship technical questions. Um, he's, I've always admired, if you don't mind me saying, you have a very good way of explaining things and you're also one of those people who like the details. So you're always the kind of person you can go to and be like, how does this actually work? And Charlie's the one to explain it. So thank you for that and thanks for sharing this with all our guests. So the first question I have for you, Charlie, is about the stabilizers. The stabilizers are like these wings that come out of the side of the ships about two thirds back under the water and they make the ride a whole lot more comfortable. And I know sometimes when the bridge, you just see the instruction is just for to have one stabilizer out, um, sometimes both, sometimes none. How do they really work? And how do you decide, you know, is it all automated? How do you figure that all out and how do they work? Yeah, exactly. So um, on, on the sky ships, for example, there's, there's two stabilizers. Um, they are these big wings that are housed in, in the side of the vessel. So they're not sticking out when they're, when they're not deployed. Um, and they fold out, they're, they're folded forwards and they, they fold out backwards like so. And on the back of them is a, a little flap like an aeroplane wing. Um, they've got their own computer system inside them. So as the, the ship is rolling, they automatically calculate how they need to move that flap on the back. And the same way that you see an, an aircraft roll to the left or right, it's exactly the same on the ship. Um, on the sky ships, they, they extend about three meters out to the side and they're about one and a half meters in, in length as such. Um, and you, you're exactly right, they, they can operate independently. Um, and so you, we often only use one. Two reasons for that. Um, it might be that there's less drag. One stabilizer does about 70% of the work, so you don't always need two. Um, and one of the most important reasons why we might only use one is particularly uh, important down south of, uh, south of 60 degrees, and that's ice. Um, when you're navigating in the ice, it's also some of the rougher water. Um, you may want to have the comfort of the stabiliser, but the bridge officer wants the comfort in their minds that if they need to turn quickly, they have got one clear side of the vessel that they can take some of the small pieces. Ultimately, as you're into that icier water, lots of growlers around and um, these smaller pieces of ice, which are sort of a danger to you, having the, the stabilisers out is, is more of a risk. And so you end up bringing them in. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in an Antarctic cruise, sometimes it's not the most comfortable cruising, um, especially on, the, um, to, on some of the tighter turns that we take, because the ship will roll more to the side. Um, but that's where passenger vessels are, are comfortable in general with their stability. Okay. And apart from ice, which we obviously don't want the stabilizers to touch, but what is the normal risk of them snagging something? And um, have you had any issues with them snagging animals or snagging things? Yeah. So um, animals I've, I've never heard touch wood, uh, never had an incident with. Um, you always are uh, worried about fishing markers and, and things like that. Um, cruising up and down the, the coast of India, there's a lot of fishing gear um, and you do worry about the possibility of snagging, uh, snagging some, some fishing lines and things. Um, I have heard stories of boys being picked up. Um, fortunately, most of the time, as you stretch out the line that that boy is on, it pings off and it goes back to its normal, its normal rate. Um, worst case scenario is yes, you end up doing some damage. Um, and that's where you have to go down the route of, of repairs and you speak to the wonderful colleagues in the, in the engineering department and whether they can help or you then have to go the route, down the route of getting divers in to make an inspection. Yeah, I could make some local enemies if you're snagging around everyone's exactly. fishing gear. I know exactly. there's They're... a place we've been to where there's just fishing gear everywhere and a lot of it sort of yeah. shouldn't be there, you know, but of, of course, you know, it is. Um, okay, yeah. so 
stabilizing through the stabilizers. And another way that I know we sometimes use, but I've never fully understood, is using ballast, um, mm. whether it's fuel or seawater or water. How do we use the ballast? That's all the water bodies on the ship or liquid bodies on the ship. How do we use those? Yeah, exactly. So um, as you say, we've got three main bodies of water that we can use on or fluid on the ship. Um, you've got your, your fuel or your diesel, you've got your fresh water and you've got your, your seawater ballast. Um, most ships, as they, you know, the cargo ship, for example, when they've got cargo on board, they'll have that as their main weight that's keeping oh, yeah, them right. nice and stable. As they discharge all of their cargo, let's say it's a you know, bulk, you know, bulk carrier of some kind, are they going to introduce ballast to make the, to make the ship stable and that's to stop it from capsizing. Um, very similar, you know, for passenger vessels, as, as you start to use up your, uh, your diesel or your fuel, um, you might then start to introduce uh, seawater, um, seawater ballast. It wasn't so much needed on the sky ships um, that we'd need to ballast as we use what we, you know, our, our stores and our fuel. Um, but where we would use ballast if, if necessary um, was if it was a fairly uncomfortable sea, you can um, put ballast into the forepeak, you know, the, the forward part of the ship, and that can stop the, the bouncing, the pitching motion of the vessel so much. Um, and other ways are if there's a, a strong wind, we'd prefer to use uh, fresh water and uh, fuel rather than introducing seawater. Um, you could just move those from one side to the other to help keep the ship upright. Thank you. And that leads me well into the next question, which is the water, the fresh water. Now I know ferries and you know vessels that come alongside very frequently they might just bunker water from ashore, but we are oftentimes weeks without going alongside, and so we make our own water as do many vessels. How do we, or generally, how do vessels make their water at sea? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned before, cargo ships, passenger vessels, you know, operate fairly similarly. Um, a cargo ship might use uh, a fresh water or a seawater evaporator, and they'll just evaporate the fresh water off the, off the salt water. It doesn't have so much yield though, so that's where reverse osmosis um, is, is brought into the scenario for, for passenger vessels. Um, on the sky ships, I remember we used to make, just we had two reverse osmosis plants, and we'd make somewhere between 35 and 40 tonnes per day with just one unit um, in its optimum uh, scenario. It would be less in colder water, a little bit uh, more in warmer water. So with two units running, you could be seeing, you know, 50 to 60 tonnes, maybe more in sort of production of water per day. Um, and you're basically stripping all of the impurities and the salt water out of the water through, you know, through that reverse osmosis. Um, chain and then putting it into the tanks. Um, some of the drawbacks from it, um, in order to start yielding that water and getting some production, you actually have to start flushing those units through. So for the first two to three, maybe four hours, you may not see any production. Um, so if it's just a short four hour passage from one anchorage to another, you may not see you know, any, any yield from that. Um, and so things that go hand in hand is conserving water even when you don't need to. Um, we've both been in the Indian Ocean where people get off from a snorkel perhaps and they wanted to have a shower at the end of their day um, and maybe you know these showers it could be two or three a day uh, but also ensuring that you know you only use the water that you need um, to remain comfortable and you know but also not overspend that water um, yeah. because it, it's one of the things that stops you from going, or it's, it's, if you, without water, sorry, um, it's one of the things that will make a ship go into port very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, other interest, how big is that reverse osmosis machine? Is it the size of a small car? Is it a fax machine? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the ones on the island sky and the, the other sky ships, for example, would be you take up the space of a small car, uh, the two of yeah. them together. Um, but of course, that's just a, one small component of the, uh, of the mm. freshwater system. Uh, there were then just over 200 tons of, you know, 200 cubic meters of space for, for freshwater tanks. Um, and, you know, I said about production being somewhere between 50 and 60 tons, depending on, um, depending on sort of various scenarios. Um, that consumption could easily be in the 35 to 45 ton range. Um, do you find uh, bigger uh, differences between uh, 
things. <laughs> but it's exactly, it can depend. So expedition cruising, for example, you might have, um, you know, more consumption because uh, there's more showers just because of the operations that are going on. Whereas destination cruising, you could see higher consumption because the deck crew are doing more washing. Um, or it could be that, you know, in the galley that particular day, they were doing um, a different dish that required more washing of vegetables. Or it could be that the, the laundry is doing a linen change on that day. Or it could just be down to the nationality of the passenger. Ooh, I'll leave that one. Uh, I'll just leave that one hanging in the air. <laughs> um, all right. And then I know sometimes we can't make water. You were saying, you know, you need a couple of hours passage to make water. But there's also times when, say, around, around glaciers, it's very silted up or around muddy rivers and stuff. So you also need to be a little bit further out to see in more clear seawater, I gather. Exactly. The, the optimum scenario is to be in deep water and whilst we're sailing. Um, of course, when you're stopped, um, you're also, you don't know what's coming out from places around you. It could be that there's a, a fairly remote village and you don't know where their sewage is going. You don't want to be contaminating, you know, your water supply with, with their black water. Um, as you say, it could be silty. Uh, osmosis has, you know, lots of, you know, you know um, usable parts and the filters get blocked if you, you know, to start running your osmosis plants, for example, in the Amazon River. Um, you know, they have run for yeah. 30 minutes and they'd stop. Um, so there are lots of things that the chief officer who looks after, and you know, the chief officer and the chief engineer, um, really have to work as a team to work out when, when they can really produce water and produce it well. Yeah, it's not just an automatic process. All right, mm. so the next question is the garbage. I know where I live, there's a lot of ships anchored out, you know, waiting to go in the harbour. And I've heard occasionally people say they think sort of all the garbage on the beach, like, oh, it comes from the ships as though ships throw their garbage out at sea. And I'm like, no, oh, it comes from sort of collectively us, um, you know, on land and everywhere. Um, but tell us a little bit about the garbage handling at sea. Again, sometimes we're weeks and weeks at sea without going to port. Um, and it's a small ship with, you know, space is always at a premium. Um, how do we manage the garbage? So it's, uh, you know, you go back 30, 40 years, it was a really easy scenario managing the garbage because the sea was your dustbin. Um, and quite rightly so now, there are um, environmental concerns and ecological concerns that mean that we should be keeping our garbage on board. And um, I'm very fortunate since ever I've, whenever I've been at sea, um, it's been managed properly. Um, and in many ways, shipping manages their garbage much better than many countries do. Um, so from a you know, deck officer on the bridge, uh, we have five dustbins. Um, where you might only have one in your kitchen, we have five. Um, one was for plastic, one was for food waste, metal, uh, paper, all of these things sort of broken up. Uh, and then that's kept sorted on board the ship. Of course, it goes from our dustbin on the bridge down to our garbage room. Um, we would store all of our garbage. There was one particular crew member whose job it was to make sure everything was compacted down of many places. Uh, you know, when you go alongside, might charge you for volume rather than weight of garbage. Uh, and so it's in your interest, not only because you haven't got much space, as you mentioned, uh, to reduce that volume, um, but also um, keep it, you know, as, as small as possible, because there's two factors. One, that you run out of space, and then no one likes to be able to, you know, having to put garbage in, in odd places. Uh, but also it's a, a knock-on effect in, in cost of the, of the voyage as well. Um, so some things that help uh, is if you have a if you, you know, happen to have used a plastic bottle although we, we have reduced our plastic water bottle consumption is crushing it before uh, putting it in the bin um, same goes for cans on the ship they're using uh, can crushers and they're also using uh, glass um, I want to say glass crushers, but the, the glass crushers that they have on board it basically makes a fine glass powder um, oh wow yeah, that really sort of crushes it all down. Um, and it's, it's not a big space to, to house all that garbage. So it's, it's, a, it's a mean feat what we do on board. Mm. And I think the food goes to an, um, a food, is it food to waste? Uh, food yeah, to we had a, a, a food digester. Um, imagine a box that eats like a human. 
Uh, you can't <laughs> overfeed it on um, on too many things. Um, I believe you know some of the ships have named theirs and, and given them different names after different people. Um, but the yeah, it, it's effectively it, it's 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 the same shape as um, or size as. Um, a big sort of rotisserie barbecue um, has a big door that you can open up, you put everything in, and there's uh, bacteria inside, sort of artificial bacteria uh, that eat the food. Um, some things they can't eat in the same way that you and I can't eat chicken bones and we can't eat the bones. Um, the digester can't eat the bones. And so uh, when we're more than 12 miles from land and uh, you know, we satisfy the sort of international requirements, you can then discharge food waste over, overboard. So most importantly, you really don't want the food digester to be named like Charlie or Pam or anything like that. Exactly, right. yeah, exactly <laughs> Something right. you know to sort of work towards in your in your ship career. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so my next question is, and thanks for that. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, my next question is flags. So um, when we see a passing ship. Um, you often you could look at it with the binoculars and you see what flag they're flying and tell us what flags we fly and when. I mean, just generally the country flags. Yeah, so um, at the back of the ship, generally you have a, a, a sort of big flag on the sky ships. Uh, it's the Bahamas flag. Uh, I think on the uh, Serenissima, or maybe wrong, it's the Maltese flag. Um, and the I think it's St. Vincent that, and the Grenadines. So St. Vincent and um, Grenadines. So you've got that big flag at the back. That is the, the flag of registry for the vessel. Um, and so it's basically the, the nationality of that ship. And there's a whole host and of And that's the law that we why. fall under, that law of that nationality. That exactly, day. yeah. Um, so, you know, if you do something wrong and you're in international waters, um, the Bahamas is the, the country that is, uh, is looking into it. So from a sort of operational perspective, um, there are also the people that enforce various different uh, maritime regulations on us. So whereas you might come on board and think, oh, I've come from the, the UK, um, the, the law that I'm actually looking at is the Bahamas maritime regulations. Um, they're very closely linked to, uh, let's say, the, you know, the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Administration or, um, Authority's uh, website um, and their, their laws. Uh, but they are slightly different in their own different ways. Um, and so you do have to be coherent in each different flag state's uh, regulations on, on where you're operating. Other and Charlie, if you, you don't mind flying. me jumping in yeah. there, I know, um, you know, flags of convenience have a sort of negative uh, reputation, but in a way, mm. this is, Bahamas is kind of a flag of convenience or maybe inconvenience um, in the way that it's quite a prestigious flag and it means yeah. that you've got quite high standards of health and safety and employment rules yeah. and so on and so forth. So it is a flag of convenience in the sense that um, it's not where, really where we base ourselves or where we come from, but it's a really good status flag to have. Mm. It is certainly, and that's why so many different passenger vessels and, and cruise companies use the Bahamas as a, as a place to flag themselves. Um, it's a, a high standard of safety, but also um, you know, a good place for crew members to think, ah, oh, that hold on, that vessel's registered in the Bahamas. I, you know, um, there's some safety in, as, a, as a crew member to think about that. So the, um, okay. the other kinds of flags that we have up on, on the ship, uh, you know, we mentioned before, um, you know, up forwards, there's a few different sort of halyards that we can we can then put the flags up on. Uh, generally, you'll display a, a house flag, and that might be the, the flag of the company that you're operating for. So if you ever see the, the Noble Caledonia flag flying on the ship, that's that's the house flag. Uh, and then also when we're going into port in, a, in another country, we'll fly their flag. Um, so entering Greece, you'll, you know, as you take the pilot, we'll often put a, a flag up, or as we go to Antarctica when we're taking the pilot in the Beagle Channel for Argentina, we'll put the Argentine flag up. The most important thing is that whoever's putting the flag up, they know not to put it in, up, upside down, uh, because then you're declaring war on that country, uh, and that may not be the thing that you want to do uh, on arrival. Yeah, that's a, that's a good little top tip there. I think mm -hmm. that I'm pretty sure that's happened to us once. You know, one of those tree colored flags that's sort of like, you know, very similar. I'm sure we hung exactly. a flag upside down once and someone yeah, was like, it's, get it's, that flag down. It certainly happens. I, I remember a, a time when I was in, in the Gulf in, in 2016 and we raised the flag. I think it was in Bahrain or Qatar. Um, and we ended get, up getting, a, I think it was a hundred or $150 flying because 
they had brought out a new flag that had an extra squiggle in it. So, you know, it just, it, it depends on, it depends on the flag. Um, and then also um, something that always uh, makes, you know, technically, you know, as a, as a cruise officer in the merchant navy, and it always tickles us, um, is if you go to dip your flag, a traditional salute would be lowering your, your, your ensign, your, your our Bahamas flag in the case of the sky ships. Um, you would lower that in, in sign of salute to the Royal Navy. Um, and I remember going into, sorry, departing the Falklands uh, yes, earlier this did. year, um, or to 18 months ago or so, we dipped our flag um, as the HMS Clyde was, was coming in. Uh, and you just see the, you know, one of the uh, able seamen from, from their vessel running back to dip their flag in response. Um, and I seem to remember the, the rope got a little bit tangled because it was a windy day. Uh, but the important thing was uh, saluting them as they went past. I remember it was as though they didn't expect us to salute them and they and they we sort of took them by surprise. They're like, oh, that's a tradition we like maybe not all of exactly. are doing that. And then we saluted them with our flag and they were like, oh, and they quickly ran to to lower their or did they lower theirs as well? That was the protocol. They, they lowered theirs and then I couldn't put ours back up and that was I think quite amusing. I think it was uh, Captain Henry Carlson <laughs> on board at the time, so uh, he was having a good old chuckle. <laughs> yeah, I'm mortified. Um, yeah. Okay, well, that is uh, so interesting. And then one little strange law that I don't know if it still exists, but you always talk about it is if you're in distress and you need to be towed mm -hmm. and you give someone else your rope to tow you, there was like, you know, something that happens now, you belong to them. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's it's a salvage and all of that is it's a uh, there's people that study that for years in, in law and things. Um, I think if you remain on the vessel, then you, it's a pretty safe bet that it's going to remain yours. Um, but there's you know you look at um, you know previous maritime accidents and, and things like that, um, and it really does get down into the nitty gritty of the contract. Um, but if we think of something that you know will probably be in the back of minds for uh, UK sort of residents and things was the, the Hoga Saka. Um, it was a car carrier that rolled over in the, in the Solent. Um, you then, you know, salvage contractors will come together and uh, be thinking, well, is this ship going to float again? Therefore, will it be operating as a ship again? Or is it going to end up becoming our property and can we sell it for scrap? Um, and that can be, it, it, it's, it's a, a minefield of, of sort mm. of legal nuance, but, um, Yes, if, if maybe you plan, 200 if you years ago, somebody. it was a whole lot simpler because it's the butt of a lot of jokes, you know, even just between zodiacs. If you needed a tow, yeah. like, oh, you know, exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm probably today, as you, you say, the litigators got involved and took all the fun out of that law, <laughs> exactly. They did. I mean, so yeah, if you do plan to help, you know, if you do plan to help somebody and you're hoping to claim salvage on their vessel, just make sure you have the legal mind to do so first, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, young guys or girls who would like to become cadets at sea and take the officer mm. route like you have, I mean, you'll obviously, I'm sure, work your way towards captain and it's quite a fun job at sea, certainly so far. How would sort of young folks go into that pathway? Yeah, so I mean, so many people that I've spoken to and trained with in the past, they found out about a career at sea by having a family member or a friend doing it. Um, we're incredibly fortunate in the UK, and it is the UK route that I know that there is a fully sponsored scheme to do so. Um, it takes between two and a half to three and a half years, depending on the route that you need. Um, but it's a it's like a double a double sandwich university course. You spend some time at college, you go to sea for a while. You spend some more time at college, you go to sea, and then you go back to college to do your final exams. Um, fully sponsored all the way through, either under a deck officer, engineering officer, or an electrotechnical officer route. Um, and at the end of it, you have a license which you can roam on on the high seas for. Um, you've been sponsored, so you're not having to worry about a, a student loan in some way. Um, you have skills that, yes, I can navigate, but I've also done a week's firefighting and, and you know, all of these sort of diverse skills that you can have, but you also get to travel the world um, working for, you know, maybe four months and then having two months off. It's four months of Mondays followed by two months of Sundays. It's a pretty good balance. Well, thank you for that. And I think that uh, a lot of our guests know people who might like to 
participate in this sort of career. So, mm. Charlie, thank you so much for your time. It's been uh, very You're fun welcome. and so interesting. These are the sorts of questions that I'm sure a lot of people either have never thought about or have thought about, but never really had the right person to ask. So appreciate mm. your time. We might have to do another one to talk uh, bulbous bowels and bowel thrusters, but we'll save that exactly. for another day and enjoy the rest well, of your you. day. Have a good one. Bye.